After the fight comes the party, right? After the fight, the victor gets the palm, we say. Palms have always been, it seems, a symbol of victory. And at the beginning of Lent, I told you that this season is one for fighters. You may recall that. Lent is for fighters. And at the end of Lent comes the victory, and palms are for victors. It is a glorious scene that we are treated to today, isn't it? I don't just mean in the readings, but I mean here in the church. It's a glorious thing to gather together outside to do something a bit out of the usual, to do something that the children surely remember. I have lots of fond memories of tickling my brothers with my palms, of poking the people in front of me and being told, David, knock it off. It's a glorious thing. It is today And it was back then, long ago. Picture that scene with me here this morning. There were all kinds of pilgrims gathered at Jerusalem. They were there to celebrate a feast. And not just any old feast, not just a common, regular, you know, big food party, but the feast of feasts for the Jewish people. They were there to celebrate the Passover. And you remember, of course, what the Passover commemorated. You remember how the Passover marked year after year after year the memory of what God had done for his people down in Egypt, how he had brought them out with a mighty hand and a strong arm, how he had given them the victory over Pharaoh. Maybe you even remember the song that they sang on the banks of the Red Sea, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed. Gloriously, the horse and the rider have been thrown into the sea. That feast, Passover, was one full of glory for the people. And with that glorious feast came lots of glorious expectations, lots of glorious hopes, lots of glorious dreams. Hey, maybe what he did for us long ago down in Egypt, he's going to do all over again. That's the way it goes, right? If something good has happened to you in the past, you always want to get back to it. You always want it to happen again and again and again and more and more and more. And so the people gathered there at Jerusalem were gathered with dreams of glory in their mind. And Jesus went with it, didn't he? Jesus didn't tamp down everyone's dreams and expectations. Jesus played to the crowd. He sat On the donkey, he rode into the city. He didn't tell anyone to be quiet. In fact, the Pharisees told him, hey, why don't you tell these people to be quiet? And Jesus said, if they're quiet, even the stones will cry out. What a glorious scene. And along with that glorious scene came all kinds of hopes and dreams about what this Jesus would do. Now, our text says that his disciples didn't understand what all was going on. And if the disciples didn't understand it, you can be sure, right, that the crowd didn't get it either. If we were able to go back in time and pull maybe 10 people aside and say, hey, what are are you so excited about? I bet we'd get at least seven different answers, right? There'd be some people who would be excited for one thing, others for something else. Others would probably just say, I don't know what the big deal is, but this is fun, getting to throw down palm branches, getting to shout, getting to be part of a procession, that's fun. Who doesn't want to do that? They were excited, that's my point. And with that excitement, with that expectation, with that fervor, there were all kinds of dreams of glory. Hosanna to the son of David, they shouted. Hosanna, which means save us. And of course, we know the deepest meaning of that word, but salvation can take lots of forms for lots of different people, right? So I'm sure there were some who were saying, save us from the Romans. Come in and kick out these Romans and all of their taxes. Reestablish for us, Jesus, what we once had under David. Others, perhaps, weren't so upset with the Roman occupation of Judea, but were upset with the leaders of the day. This always happens, doesn't it? It happens in our own day and age that those who rule over the people rule in a bad way. And so there were probably many, many, many in the crowd who were hoping that not only would Jesus get rid of the Romans, but he would also get rid of the priests, the high priest, and all the people who had made the temple into a corrupt thing. They were hoping for national renewal. They were hoping for religious renewal. And maybe some were just hoping that, you know, Jesus could fix their problems, kind of like we hope, right? 
After all, they had heard what Jesus had done. They had heard how he had given sight to the blind, how he had made the lame walk, how he had given bread to 5,000 people, how he had called Lazarus out of the tombs. And so maybe if we pulled some of those people aside and we asked them what they were so excited about, they would say, well, I don't really know, but I think he's going to fix all my problems. I think he's going to make sickness a thing of the past. I think he's going to make scarcity a thing of the past. I think he's going to do away with suffering. I hope that's what he's going to do. And still others, again, were probably just going along with the crowd. That's the way riots go, isn't it? You don't have to have a, a clearly defined vision of what's going on to know that when people are excited, you want to be part of it. You want to share in their joy. You want to share in their enthusiasm. You want to share in their happiness. The point, though, is that there were lots of different ideas about who this Jesus was, about what kind of salvation he was going to bring. And all of them were boiling up together. Everyone projects onto Jesus, don't they? That was true back then, and it is still true in our own day and age. People project their own ideas about glory and about what is good onto Jesus, and then they tell Jesus, now give it to us, right? So if healing is good, Jesus, give me healing. If money is good in my mind, well, then Jesus should make me rich. If having a happy family is good in my mind, well, then surely Jesus will give me a happy family. If having a healthy nation is good in my mind, then surely that's just exactly what Jesus should do. After all, he's the Messiah, and the Messiah should do, well, what I want him to do. Everyone projects onto Jesus. You heard how some Greeks wanted to get a piece of the action too. Sir, they said, we wish to see Jesus. And I wonder if that sight that they wanted to have with Jesus was more like this. We want to give him some advice. We want to pull him aside and tell him what he should do with this excitement that he has. After all, he could really capitalize on this. He could get rid of the Romans. He could establish his own kingdom. He could kick out the priests. He could cleanse the temple. He could do whatever he wants, but he just needs a little bit of advice. It's tempting, isn't it, to think that Jesus needs our advice, to think that Jesus doesn't have his own ideas of glory, but that he needs us to kind of help him along the way, that he needs us to tell him how it should really go and how things should really be and what exactly he should give to each one of us. The Jews were confused too. How is it that you say that you must be lifted up? We thought that the Messiah would be permanent We thought that when the Messiah came, you know, he would do all the things that we wanted him to do. He would get rid of the Romans. He would cleanse the temple. He would heal all of our diseases. What's this business about being lifted up? How about you? What do you project onto Jesus? Do you project your own ideas about the good life and what Jesus should give you? Or do you accept everything from him with humility and patience? When we're honest with ourselves, we find ourselves very much at home with that crowd, don't we? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We get all excited for Palm Sunday, as we should. We get all excited to wave our branches and sing these great hymns and to be part of the joy of the disciples of Jesus. But just like the crowd then, we don't always understand what it all means. We have our own ideas about glory, and we want Jesus to do for us, well, just what we want. We have our own hopes. We have our own dreams. We have our own pictures of glory, and Jesus, well, he should fill in the blank. But Jesus doesn't need our projections, and Jesus doesn't take advice Isn't that wonderful? Jesus doesn't take advice. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, Jesus doesn't say, okay, Greeks, tell me what I should do. Okay, Jews, tell me exactly what kind of Messiah I should be. And here's the hard one, but thanks be to God. He doesn't come to each and every one of you and say, okay, now tell me exactly what I should do for you. He's not that kind of a savior. And his glory is not that kind of glory. It is far better. 
Jesus' glory is a paradox, isn't it? Jesus has his own ideas of glory. Jesus has his own hopes. He has his own dreams. And thanks be to God, he doesn't tamp them down. He doesn't diminish his picture of glory to fit into our picture. He doesn't fit his mission into the mission that we expect from him. Instead, he says to each and every one of us, come and learn from me the path of real glory. And it is a paradox. The glory of Jesus is like a grain of wheat, he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless the grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. The glory of Jesus is not to remain alone. The glory of Jesus is to bear fruit, to bear fruit that can be enjoyed by all people. But just so, just so the glory of Jesus must pass through, here's the paradox, suffering. The glory of Jesus must go the way of the cross, not the way of Greek glory, not the way of Jewish glory, not the way of our own expectation and our hopes and our dreams. No, the glory that Jesus brings into this this world, the better glory, must go the way of the cross. Now, Jesus says, through the grain of wheat, himself falling into the heart of the earth and dying, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And that sounds really exciting, doesn't it? I'm sure that there were some in the crowd who heard him say those things and thought, all right, at last, we can get past the suffering, we can get past the dying, and we can get to the glory stuff. But notice, as soon as he says that the ruler of the world will be cast out, he says how it will happen when I am lifted up. Here is the wonderful paradox of the glory of Jesus, that it does not sidestep suffering, that it does not sidestep the cross, but embraces it wholly and completely. Because Jesus knows, right? Jesus knows better than the Jews. Jesus knows better than the Greeks. And Jesus knows better than you what glory looks like and what glory requires. The paradoxical glory of our Lord Jesus is the glory of love, Love that lays its life down for the beloved. Love that doesn't say, okay, what do you want me to do for you, but knows what is best for the other person and sees to it, even at the cost of himself, Jesus will see to your glory. The glory of Jesus is the glory of love. Or as St. Paul put it in our epistle reading, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. We like to grasp, don't we? We like to strive, we like to grab, we like to stuff things in our pockets, we like to save it up because we think if we don't do that, we're going to lose it, right? But Jesus shows you today the paradoxical glory, the better glory, the glory of love, the glory that comes not from saving your own life, but from losing it, the glory that comes from laying things down for one another, not for grabbing everything for yourself. That is the glory of Jesus, and that is the glory that fills Palm Sunday with a victory that no victory party can ever compare with. That is the glory of this week, that God has sent his son into this world not to grab, grab, grab for himself, but to give, to lay his life down, to cast out the ruler of this world, Satan, by offering his blood in your place. For now there is an answer for accusations. Now there is a blood that pleads for atonement. Now there is blood that pleads for your forgiveness. And so there is an answer for every accusation. There is an answer for every sin. There is an answer for all of your guilt. There is an answer for all of your shame. And just so, just so there is a glorious hope. There is a glorious dream prepared for you. Our hopes and dreams often crash and burn, don't they? And when they do, when they do, there is all kinds of ache and pain and disappointment. Our hopes and dreams for our families, our hopes and dreams for our nation, our hopes and dreams for our church maybe, our hopes and dreams for our own career, our hopes and dreams for our own lives do not pan out. And when they crash and burn, there is disappointment and pain. The hope and dream of Jesus is one that does not crash, that does not burn. So learn to walk in his path. Learn to follow the path of Jesus. Learn to pursue his glory and to forget all the other hopes and dreams that you may have. For with Jesus, with Jesus there is a hope that will not disappoint. With Jesus there is a glory that will never let you down. It is the glory of love. 
Oh, yes, it's a paradox, to be sure, not to go through this world trying to grab, grab, grab for yourself, but laying your life down. But in that, in that, just like the Son of Man, you will be lifted up. You will be lifted up with him, which is who the Son of Man was always supposed to be. If you go back this afternoon and you read the book of Daniel chapter 9, you'll hear who the Son of Man is. And there's this wonderful ambiguity. Is it Jesus or is it the saints? Is it the Christ or is it his people? Well, how about both? Both together. Here is the glory of your Lord Jesus, that he comes not to earn things for himself, but he comes to raise you up. And so when he is lifted up, he will draw all of us to be with him. He will draw all of us into the glory of his love. And when you come to share in that love, when you have experienced it for yourself, then you will know exactly what to do. You will know how to lay down your life for one another. That is is the glory of Palm Sunday. That is the victory that comes to the fighters of Lent, the victory of love. Or, how did Jesus put it? He who loves his life in this world will lose it, but whoever hates his life will keep it for eternal life. That is our hope. That is our dream. Let us pursue the path of our Lord Jesus, the paradox of orthodoxy, the paradox of his glory, the glory of love that does not look to gain, 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 to grab, 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 to keep, keep, keep. But how can we love one another? To Christ be the glory now and always. Amen.